Welcome all you peace love and supers. I'm Brian Delaney and I'm Tave Fashe Drake. Welcome to the Peace Love and Soup's very first shelter in place episode. Now normally we start with the soup and then sometimes we add a side, a salad or cheese or bread. And this time however we're doing something differently because we are starting with the side and today it is going to be bread. Yes and whenever we talk bread Baker Dan is present, so let's get him in on the action. Hello, Baker Dan, and welcome to Peace, Love, and Soup, the Shelter and Place Show. Thanks, Brian and Tavi. Good to see you guys. Dan, I'm so sorry I couldn't get you your yeast, but it was a big motivator for the Zoom chat. You know, you had mentioned that there's yeast everywhere in the air. The same day that Tavi, she asked me if I wanted some of her sourdough starter. Personally, I was so confused. I was like, what are you people talking about? And that's when we decided, well, let's talk about it. So let's share what we know. Tava, do you want to start off the bread making process? Sure. First of all, what I have to say is this is the simplest thing in the world. We're going to start out with a canning jar and about a quarter cup of flour. The thing you're going to do is no matter how much flour you're using, use about the same amount of water. I've pre-measured this water. I just want to show off our new swag here too. <laughs> So I mix these two things together so that all of the lumps are out. So that's looking pretty good. Then you're not screwing anything down. You're just going to set a lid on it, put it aside. That's it. The very next day, you're going to have something that looks sort of like this. It's going to look kind of plain, not very bubbly. Let's pretend it's day two. Get rid of half. And I'm going to keep about half. And then I'm going to feed it again. The flour and the water and mix it up. We'll be doing that same thing every day from about 5 to 15 days, depending. What are we going to do with this discard? Now, some people just throw theirs away, but I can't bear to do that. So one of the things that we've been doing a lot at our house is using a panini press. And it's getting warmer and stuff, too. So it's, it's a nice alternative to turning on the stove all the time. So watch this. I just take it, I'm pouring it straight into this panini press. All that is is discard starter. I'm not adding anything else, although I like a salty sort of bread. So I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and then I'm just gonna shut it and it's gonna end up making like a nice little flat bread or kind of like a cracker, depending on how long you let it sit in there. That's so that's all it. of like two minutes, not even. Yeah, it's super easy, right? Look what we've got here. If you want it sort of like a flat bread, Will that crisp up like a cracker? It will. I'll leave one of those in here and we'll pull it out a little later. But you can do that anytime early on with starter that's not ripe enough to make bread with. But also as you get going on this, if you just say, gosh, I cannot make bread every day. That's one of the other things you can do. And if you don't have a panini press, you can stick it right in a cast iron skillet or any other kind of pan and just make flat bread out of it. So how you'll know that it's done, your starter mother, it's going to start looking like this, double or triple, getting really ripe. Wow. Stuff starts getting a nice smell to it, a little bit sweet, a little bit alcoholic, depending on how warm the area you live in is and how warm your home is. That's awesome. You see all the bubbles in there? So that's when you know, oh gosh, I can actually make bread out of this now. I like to keep a half cup. I'm going to eyeball it about that much. Baking with one hand, that's what we should call it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good skill to have. So we set that aside and now this is our mother and we always want to tend our mother well. I've put some hash lines on here. Let's say this is about how much starter you had left. And then we're just gonna add flour and I do it straight into my container. So just gonna add it in and I'm gonna get flour till it's up to somewhere in that second line there, and then add water. The ratio is the amount of starter you've got, add the same amount of flour and the same amount of water. And then you're just gonna mix it up really nicely, just like we did earlier when we were starting out. Get all of the clumps, the flour out. Personally, when I feed mine on the countertop, it is about equal parts flour and water. But while they recommend you do the quantity that is in the jar, you can feed it less. 
and keep it alive. That's interesting. Cool. See, it's looking pretty good. I'm gonna set the mother to the side. Again, I'm just barely gonna set that lid on top of it. And I'm gonna let that sit until tomorrow. See that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's four of us here right now, my husband and myself and my older daughter and her boyfriend. So we can go through a loaf of bread every day, no problem. Let's say we're getting tired of it. We don't even want crackers anymore. You can just take your starter, like so, and just store it in the refrigerator. What I do in those instances, I just write the date. It's hard to remember during COVID. You can't even remember what day of the week it is. Oh, I know. Okay, so we've got that. And then you can store it right in the refrigerator. And all you have to do when you're keeping it in the refrigerator is keep the lid a little bit ajar. Make sure you pull it out about once a week and feed it. Also, you could put some aside for friends. I've got a few of these waiting to go to some people and they don't need a whole lot. So cool. go to our website, peaceloveandsoup.com and subscribe to our newsletter and put a note in. We could send you some stuff. And rate it and give it a great review. <laughs> All right, getting back to this. This is our thing that we're gonna make bread with today. Similar to if we were just feeding it, pour about the same amount of flour and water in. You'll notice I'm not even measuring. This is a very different thing than using yeast that you buy in the grocery store, which has to have just the right temperature and just the right timing. Sourdough is so natural and forgiving. Yeah, my process is a lot like yours, Tavi. I'm a little bit more regimented. I like to measure and I like to do that because I like to recreate and then change what I've created and know what I did the last time. Thanks Baker Dan, that's good to know. Yes, but see that's kind of looking really nice. Now we'll just add some more flour and then salt. I did want to point out salt is important. It does a couple of things that are necessary for a good bread structure. It slows your fermentation, so it strengthens your dough, so you're going to get a better bounce back, and also adds flavor. Really? There we go. Because see how it's starting to pull away now from the mm -hmm. sides of the wall? So, hold on. This is a, don't get seasick. The one-armed method. Ooh, it's like spin art. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should food color it and see what we got. So it's getting there. We need a little more flour. What's the final dough look like? You can see it's starting to kind of pull apart. And that's where you can even get your hands in. And it becomes stringy, I guess. Contrary to popular belief, you do not have to be kneading this for hours on end. It doesn't need to be a 20 minute knead. You just want to get everything nicely distributed, folding it in on itself. I do need mine. Um, I need for about depends on there's no exact amount of time you know when you can stretch it and get the window pane huh i think you can see right now it's pretty dang close very simple to tell when you're finished so it's going to be similar to that and then all we're going to do is put a lid on top of it and let it sit to rise for an hour or four hours this one I did earlier. If you push down on it and it doesn't fill back in, then it's ready. One of the other tricks is if you want to reduce the amount of time or if your house isn't warm enough, just come over to your oven and turn it on to warm and you're going to set it for one minute. As soon as it gets to one minute, you're going to shut everything off. So then we turn it off and instead of leaving it out, you could set that bowl right on this floured pan here, or you could put it in a cast iron skillet, which you could choose to either oil or flour, then put it into our oven for an hour and let it proof in there. I do a longer rise, three hours, punch it down, divide it into the loaves, and let it rise another two hours. I heard you can either bake something right then that night, or you can put it in the refrigerator, yep. and it'll even rise a little bit in the refrigerator. And then you can do it in the morning and have fresh bread in the morning. Yep. That bread is going to be more sour than the one if you just baked it right then and there. I think so too. And it'll be more flavorful without it. Great. Right. This tiny loaf has been in there for an hour or so rising. And then you might even want to score it with a sharp knife. You could do something fancy, some little spirals on it. Because when it rises, then it's going to just give it some fault lines. 
And now we're gonna put it in and bake it. If you like your outer to be really crusty and crunchy, you could take, this is just a little pan of water. You could take some water and sprinkle it on it like so. And then what you could also do is take a little bit of salt, sprinkle some of that on top, and then put it right in your oven. If you want it really crusty, you take a little pan of water and set that right in there next to it. So this is our baking time now. What I found is it wants to bake a little longer than you think. That loaf is little, so 40 minutes max and 400 degrees. You could even check it at 30. I did read one thing the other day, like how do you know when it's done? And one of the things is you can put a thermometer into it, and if it reads 190 degrees, then it's finished. True. But that's it. That is it. Wow. So I wanted to make sure that you all did get to see the cracker that came out of the panini press. That's so good. Can you hear it? It's all crispy on the outside and still a little warm in the inside. <laughs> Baker Dan, I'd love to hear your methods. Right. I'm going to even meet myself and pay really good attention. Okay, let's do it. I tend to make two different shapes. I'm going to flip my camera just to show you guys a little bit. I like to do a loaf. It's easy to pop right in the freezer afterwards. I just want to say you have a beautiful kitchen, Baker Dan. Oh, <laughs> thank you. This was a long remodel. Wow. So this is the starter that I work on every day. It's a lot like Tabe's. I have it loosely covered. Your starter can change over time. You can get one from a friend and it'll start off tasting and smelling considerably different than it might after a week in your home because the cultures in the air, the microbes that are in the yeast are settling into your starter and it will affect it. Baker Dan, I want you to turn your camera around so we can see your handsome face. Oh. <laughs> Hey, I'm going to put my camera down while I work on this. And we were talking about how awesome sourdough bread is and why we like it so much. And, you know, I learned to love it from my dad. He used to travel with work back in the 70s. And every time he was in San Francisco, he would definitely buy a few loaves and bring them home to us. My dad did the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that and Reuben sandwiches. I would love to do a Reuben one with you guys. Maybe we can make a Reuben soup. Mm. I can make homemade sauerkraut. So with sourdough, like we talked about, the starter's gonna take on whatever atmosphere is in your house. And my love of it being so sour has led me to do some research to try and figure out how I can make it more sour. Mine started off very sour. It translated into a nice bread that you could really taste that sour tartness to. And I came upon a couple of things that really seem to help emphasize that sourness. One is you can add a little bit of rye to your starter, half rye, half white, or even some whole wheat flour seems to really help enhance that flavor. But wait to do it until your starter's already up and running and you've gotten a loaf out of it. Once it gets going, it really doesn't seem to need that much attention. And I found that by starving it, letting it go a day or even two between feedings actually intensifies that, that fermentation process, creates more alcohol, and actually adds to the tanginess as well. Huh. So I often get two days, three days between baking. I can wait a week even. Even on the counter? And it just makes it more sour. It does, and it gets right back up and going. You'll see that it'll separate a little and you'll start to get that brown liquid on top, which is actually the alcohol that's created in the fermentation process. Once you get your, your starter established, it's really hard to make it go bad unless you contaminate it or you leave it in an overly warm environment. We're talking 80 degrees or more for days on end. Baker Dan, how do you know when your starter's dead? Uh, let's not jinx ourselves because we haven't had this happen. Well, I actually had a batch go bad when we had a warm spell. It started to develop mold. And at first I was super excited because I was like, woo! And then I started reading about it and I was like, yeah, that's not the right kind of mold. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then one time when I was doing a gluten-free starter, it went bad and it was a mold situation as well. Well, you brought up gluten-free. Are they more difficult starters to create and sourdough bread to make? Well, in my experience, yes. yes. <laughs> but once I got it up and going, it was fine. Obviously the bread is different because it's gluten-free, but I had started it for my brother and he really enjoyed it. I, I have something to add. <laughs> so I heard that sourdough bread is less of a problem for people that have a gluten intolerance than regular bread. Yeah, I understand that's true as well. It has something to do with the, the uh, microbes and the cultures that are in the yeast itself and the way that then that enters your digestive system and helps you actually digest the gluten that is there. Daniel, what are you doing? Are you doing a massage? Like what's going on? <laughs> Always in the kitchen kneading bread. I like doing it. It doesn't take that long. And Tavi likes the rustic no need method. Yes. I prefer to knead my bread. I'm really just trying to get it to the point where it starts to not stick to the surface and it becomes stretchy and elastic. And that's building up that gluten strand that makes it so chewy, delicious, creates the air pockets. Okay. Okay. I mean, pretty much all home-baked bread's great bread, right? Yeah. All yeah. tastes good. Whether it's rustic or somebody went to the trouble to make it like a baker would. Yeah. Especially just warm out of the oven. I love it. It's helped me pack on some COVID pounds. <laughs> uh, I have a question, Baker Dan. When you do your open houses, because you're in the real estate market, do you go early and bake bread so there's a smell of fresh bread in the air? Is that how you sell your homes? I don't, but I think that's a great idea. Any of my clients, I'm happy if you do that before we have an open. That could be your thing. You could take Baker Dan beyond Peace, Love, and Soup. <laughs> Just saying, you know. That's true. Baker Dan, you mentioned something about a window method when I was needing, and I don't know what that is. Could you show that? Perhaps? Absolutely. We're about there on this slope I'm needing, and when you take the dough and it's not needed enough, it'll tear, and so this essentially is what you want to have happen, where it can get very thin before it actually starts tearing. Oh. So my hands are kind of sticky here. It's hard to show you, but I can see through it before it starts tearing. Thin. Well, it's translucent, mm -hmm. right. That lets you know that you've kind of built up those gluten strands to be what I consider the perfect loaf. And they call it the window pane uh, effect. Because you can see through it like a window. That is wild. Yeah. <laughs> With this kind of bread and the, and the length that you prove it, it doesn't really have to get 100% to the glutinous stand. Huh. That's good to know. That glutinous strain. That's not right. You know what I mean. That just makes me think of gluteus maximus. <laughs> That's if we were baking sourdough buns. <laughs> <laughs> hey, check it out. Ooh. It's going to rise. <gasps> what? That's great. Wow. And then, ooh, let me show you something else. Look what my wife got me. It's the classic proofing basket. Oh. So you know how loaves of bread have those full circles across the top of the loaf of bread? It comes from proofing it in one of these baskets. And I also got a baguette tray. Ooh. That's what you use to form your baguettes in the second rise. Mm. Wowee. Wowee. Those are fancy gifts. They are. Baker Dan always has a little trick up his sleeve. <laughs> and I have another question, Baker Dan. You yeah. mentioned proofing. Is proofing or proofing, is there a correct way to say that, like term, or is it like tomato, tomato? It's, it's really up to the person. I actually looked it up trying to figure this out a couple months ago. And it happened because I was watching a baking video on YouTube, and I was like, is it proof or is it proof? And apparently you can say either. There are a myriad of explanations on the, on the great wide world of the web 
to explain why it would be one over the other. And quite frankly, I realized I sort of use them interchangeably. I was just going to say that there are different ways you can use the word myriad also. Yeah. So originally it was myriad would be countless, right? There's countless ways of making bread. There's myriad ways of making bread. But somehow through people misusing it as if it were the word number, like a number of, right. a myriad of, it became a myriad of ways of making bread. And so because it was misused so often, now either can be used in common parlance. <laughs> I like it. I would like to add, did you know that since 1849, the Boudin Bakery of San Francisco has been using the same sourdough culture, which they call a mother dough, for making their famous bread recipe? So important is their mother dough that it was historically saved by Louis Boudin during the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Did you know that? I wow, didn't. I did not know that. But did you know the slits that are on the top of a bread loaf originated by bakers in Europe distinguishing their specific loaf of breads from other bakers' breads? It was a way to ensure that the quality for their customer was there. Not only is that a cool thing, but it actually has a practical uh, purpose as well. It does give your bread direction to rise when it's in the oven. Without those slits, you run the risk of having bulges out the side of the loaf in a weird direction. So this contains the growth in that last push of a rise. Interesting. And it's almost like a signature or like a trademark. Exactly. But also kind of like tagging or like branding something. It is. I got a special tool that's specifically meant for bakers to be able to make the slits on the top of loaves. Well, fellas, did you know what? that this is actually a soup podcast? Yeah. And some of our listeners wrote in and shared with us their favorite kind of soup to have with sourdough. And Rose in New York City and Afa in Portland agree that it is split pea that is the best paired with sourdough bread. Lucinda, however, prefers a vegan tomato soup. And then Kevin says that the very best way is alongside mussels in garlic tomato broth soup, the way they serve it in Toronto. Mmm, that sounds delicious. I think my favorite might be vegetables and beans with sausage in a soup. It's one of my absolute favorite soups and with a good fresh loaf of sourdough to dip and help get that in your mouth. Mm, delicious. Uh, we forgot to mention Kara in Los Angeles suggests clam chowder, preferably in a sourdough bread bowl. I so agree. Fantastic. All you out there, leave us a review along with your favorite soup that you like to have with sourdough bread. And speaking of bread, Finally, we're at that point where the two of you get to show us the bread that you've made today. Quick, we're running out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> Stop it, you go first. Baker oh. Dan, I want to see your bread. Oh, all right. I make double loaf batches. If I'm going to make the mess, I might as well get two out of it. Oh. And they both were in the fridge overnight. Oh, that's good. And this one is rosemary, garlic, and Himalayan sea salt on top, and your standard bread loaf. Beautiful. What did you make? Hmm, what do we have? <laughs> da, 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 do, da, da. La, 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 la. Oh. Ooh. Like yours, this is a rosemary one, but it has Kalamata olives in it. Mm. And what I found when you're doing herbs, it wants many, many, many herbs. This is some focaccia. But with the focaccia, we found if you take almost like a cookie sheet or something that's bigger and oil the bottom of it, press it out real flat, and then focaccia has these little divots. Mm -hmm. It's because you go like this with the dough. You can put salt or whatever on it. And this is spinach feta cheese that we could uh, <laughs> keep ourselves from eating last night. So this is all we have left are these couple pieces. Then I did one that's sweet. Well, Tave, sorry to interrupt, but I, we do have to say goodbye. Um, oh, we do what? 
it's already <laughs> okay. time is up and i want everybody out there to facebook us or instagram us their idea for soups and baker dan thank you so much for participating in our first shelter in place show thanks brian tavi i'm coming over when this is over to gorge on that bread it looks delicious baker dan anytime come on over in fact come on over sooner i'll do a no contact drop off for you and fellas did you know that all kinds of soup go great with bread. Hey, absolutely. Thanks, Baker Dan. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yes, the best. Be well and eat well. Peace, love, and soup and bread. Bye. Oh wait, what is it? Is it filming?